Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of Wednesday One Thing. As always, I'm joined with my good pal, good friend, Hamza. How are you doing today, man? Hey, Mari, I'm good. How about yourself? I'm doing great. We got a really important topic, and as you can see by my background, if you're watching this on, uh, on video, uh, Apple iOS is finally releasing their take on a more private and secure user experience for their users. Really exciting because at ClearBank, we're actually doing a seminar with uh, our partners at Common Thread tomorrow about this. So this is really a little appetizer or an amuse bouche just to get your, your palate in the mood for what's coming. But the, the really high level thing to know here is that Apple has always, uh, well, they haven't always, but right now they're in the, the space of really trying to protect user privacy. Uh, if you think about the 1984 commercial in, in years past, they were always this, uh, this company that was against Big Brother and now they're really taking that into, uh, into the mainstream for their, their vision for the company. So what this means is in their iOS 14 update, they're making it much harder for companies uh, to track your whereabouts on the internet. So what they're requiring is for any iOS developer to make it explicitly clear how they're tracking users and how they're accessing their data. And they're also making data tracking an opt in, in feature, an opt in feature, whereas previously it was an opt out feature. I love this from a behavioral economics standpoint, where usually when you get people to opt in versus opt out, uh, you get uh, lower amounts of people who are opting in. Uh, but making it an opt in feature really is to help protect users' data across the internet. So, why does this matter? Well, of course, the biggest uh, use case for people using iOS phones is social media. And the biggest loser here is Facebook. And they've been out in full force making sure uh, that Apple knows how displeased they are. They even took out a full page ad in the New York Times, slamming this news, uh, saying it will be terrible for small business. Um, but at the end of the day, we're really looking at it from the impact of how D2C companies are going to, to react to this. So the first thing I like to do is embarrass Hamza with a numbers round. So the first thing I have a question for you, Hamza, is do you know what the average pay-per-click cost is for a Facebook ad? Hey, Mari. Uh, you know I love getting embarrassed in numbers rounds, but the average pay-per-ad click on Facebook, I honestly could not, could not know even like in, in, a, in a $500 range is the answer. You gotta, you gotta guess. Um, paper ad click. I'm gonna say fifty dollars. Completely random. So, so terrible. Not even close. It's thirty nine cents. So the reason that's so important is because if you're a startup and you have like a budget of ten thousand dollars a month, that can actually go quite a long way on Facebook. It still is the cheapest way to get your message, and with all the features that Facebook had for ad targeting. It's really powerful. You know exactly who you can micro target. You know the attribution if uh, they click your ad and then they don't purchase, but they used to have this uh, 26 or 27 day rolling window. They are gonna have to scale this all the way back. First of all, getting users to opt into being tracked for their data. And also they've, they've closed a lot of these features like this 27 day tracking window. So for a D2C brand, if you're overly reliant on Facebook as your acquisition channel, this is devastating news. Uh, so really what this means, the losers here, of course, are D2C brands, small businesses, or people who are fledgling businesses who are trying to get off the ground and relied on Facebook as their main acquisition channel. But I'm going to throw this over to you, Hamza, again, dealing with direct-to-consumer companies all the time. Have you noticed anything in the, in the workup to this announcement? How have people been adapting to this? And, and what can a direct-to-consumer brand do to sort of lessen the hurt of this, of this iOS update? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, Maury, I will never do a numbers round with you ever again. It just sets me up for failure every single time. Look, direct-to-consumer businesses are uh, are intrinsically linked to, to to how their Facebook ads perform, right? Facebook ads, all, not always, but almost always, are either the single largest component or a very, very major component of any direct-to-consumer startup's um, uh, customer acquisition strategy or even customer retention strategy. The way small businesses have in the past reacted to, to changes in Facebook's algorithm or to ad prices is, well, just to sort of to put it in a simple way, they really reacted to it, right? Like when ad prices go down, um, 
small businesses have taken the the initiative and up you know scaled up their customer acquisition strategies and their ad spend and when there are algorithm changes and the ads aren't performing as well there's an immediate retraction uh, contraction uh, apologies for uh, for the ad spend that a startup may be you know planning or strategizing for so a lot in the works uh, at the end of the day look an opt in option does not necessarily mean everyone's going to, to you know choose to to opt out or rather that no one's going to opt in um i think the the the, the most important misconception perhaps here is what benefits a con- are you know can a, can a consumer get from opting in right we don't really think about it like that almost all conversations we have with our friends and with our family are all about oh i saw that freaky ad i was just talking about shoes and then suddenly i'm seeing shoes all over my my news feed um end of the day like i think the the main thing here is is to be able to phrase this in a way where we're able to explain to people why uh you know having good ads for small businesses and direct consumer startups can end up benefiting the consumer as well till we have that conversation i think you know startups are going to be in a bit of a um bit of a lurch through no particular fault of their own but at the same time you know startups are resilient entrepreneurs are resilient and i'm sure we'll figure some way out i love how you're you're very pro pro team facebook over here saying that the more we can target you the better experience you'll have I actually can can act, can sympathize with that point of view. I I think it's fascinating when you talk about something that you've seen in in like on TikTok or you've seen anywhere out in the wild, you say it and it magically appears. If you really think that you're not being tracked by anyone else on the internet, you're crazy because Google does this like they actually did not have a direct response to what they're going to be doing on Android. Funny enough though, their iOS apps they do track people in the same way that uh, iOS will be restricting them so they they've proactively taken out the problem aspect of their apps so they don't have to present that opt in opt out feature so they're getting wise to it too but just to your point uh, there is definitely a, a benefit if you're someone who likes to buy a lot of things where someone can perfectly target you for the perfect object but there is always that freaky element which is like you know Facebook knows exactly where I've been on the internet. Uh, the other really interesting insight here, and it comes from a uh, good buddy Nick Sharma, who is the the king of D2C. When he was talking about uh, the winners and losers of this uh, of this change, the other people who are sort of going to be impacted here are these big ticket items. So think furniture, uh, think luxury goods. Those are the people who are going to have the hardest time with this new attribution because if you're a, a big ticket item, you need to know exactly. A dollar you spend on Facebook, how does that relate to a purchase price? So, uh, for instance, if you're, you know, if you're selling a big ticket item, people usually don't click on the ad, go directly to purchase. They click, they go do research, they ask their friends. In that 27-day window is when they come back and they make a purchase. Uh, I guess just uh, closing things off here. Um, in the field, have you heard anyone just speak directly about this, or what are you hearing frontline about people uh, thinking about their ad pricing in the next uh, month? In, in relation to this i wouldn't say this has been top of mind for most founders that i've spoken to again small sample size uh, relative to the total number of dvc founders in uh, in north america right now uh, essentially like the 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 emphasis will now be on the marketing teams at these startups to build out their their marketing funnel a little bit more but end of the day look there's so much that we still haven't you know really figured out about what's going to happen over the next few months uh it could very well all be okay but you know uh entrepreneurs and and someone taking a risk on starting a business um they love information and they let that information drive their decisions um so there will be some kind of impact but i just i just can't say what that will be till till i start hearing more about it from the founders themselves great point about building out your marketing funnel that is something that's so key if you can't attribute things on facebook get people's email addresses get their phone numbers so you can retarget them on your own terms. Uh Hamza, that's all the time we have. I would just send a, a reminder out to everyone, please please join us tomorrow uh, on LinkedIn for the future of paid media with Common Thread and us at Clearbank. Uh, it's going to be a really great event and you'll get more context onto this issue. Uh, until next time, hope you have a great rest of your day and see you later.